right, well, welcome everyone to uh, May board meeting for Steel City Academy. It's so good to have our new board members for their first in-person <laughs> board event. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Again, thank you for taking the time out to be here in support of Katie and her team. Um, we'll get started uh, with attendance roll call um, that I will record electronically. Um, and so when I call your name, just say uh, presence and then we will get that in the books. And as long as we have quorum, we're able to do votes today. So we'll approve minutes and on um, Katie, a couple items for action. And so we'll start first with roll call. Um, Anthony Washington. Here. Uh, Catherine Colton. Present. Ashley O'Neill. Here. Erica Young. Present. Gloria McDaniel Hall. Present. Michael Collins. Present. Catherine Burns. Present. And Katie Present. <clears throat> okay, so we do have enough for quorum so we can take votes today. Um, I did send out a link. Are we going to the agenda that has links on all this? I know you have said yeah, the link to documents are not opening. Right. Right. At this university laptop that I'm using, it's locked. Oh, okay. But, okay. But okay, but you have the paper copy yep. now. So um, I don't know. We'll have to figure out yep. in the future because yep. I did check all of the yep. links. Yep. Yep. Not in your they said you should be able to open it. But, um, We're behind the agenda. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Trying to save copy paper right, finance team. <laughs> I was tempted to do it in black and white, but then I was like, there's a few drawings in here. <laughs> so we double side around here. Um, so um, I know not everyone then was able to look ahead of time, but if you could take a minute, um, starting on the back of page one are the minutes from our last board meeting. You can do a review of the February board minutes. Um, if there are any additions or corrections, we will take those now. Um, if not, we will call for a motion to approve the February board minutes as entered. I make a motion to approve the February for meeting minutes. Okay. Okay. Can I just do an all call for yay or nay? Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So the board minutes from February are approved as entered. Mr. Walker, thank you. Um, and then, um, is there anyone here for public comment today? I miss your students. I am a school operations coordinator. Um, so I kind of handle IT, um, food service, all the like behind the scenes things. Uh, this is my fourth, uh, so I taught third grade for my first three years, and then the fourth grade is my school. Let us know if you have any questions later or whatnot. It doesn't have to only happen during the public comments. Welcome. Uh, okay. And so we're going to move right into the executive director report and the facilities report. So we'll turn to you. Awesome. Um, so in your packet, I've got everything stapled. Also, every time you guys come in person, I not only like to feed you, but give you some more Still City things. So <laughs> more Ms. O'Neill love to have. I use my pen as for a sign-in sheet really? on Thursday and some... Oh, well, I have an extra one. one. I need yeah. These are my favorite. I like the thing. They write so good. They're hot. Like that's my son. Like. I know. Mm -hmm. They're very smooth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for treating them. Like yes. Yes, I appreciate it. Um, so as always for ED reports, um, where our working group reports are aligned to our accountability framework from our authorizer, the ED report is aligned to our strategic plan, right? So just to reinforce, we have four big pillars around what the next five years of Steel City looks like. And so for each of the uh, reports, I dive deep into the priority areas around organizational sustainability, talent and people, quality instruction, and branding and storytelling, okay? So um, 
and organizational sustainability. There were three big key results that I was working towards this year. Uh, and there was a big one met since the last time we met. So we have officially closed uh, on our new school building. So, um, you know, that had been, you know, originally it was supposed to be an April 16th close. Um, when we did our final walkthrough, the building was not ready as outlined by our purchase sale agreement and the legal um, documents that we had signed. So we really had the ground, the building needed to be cleared and cleared means cleared. <laughs> um, and so there was a lot of back and forth, um, but we did get the entire building cleared, um, including the second floor and the auditorium, did a final walkthrough and we fully closed on the building. Um, so very, very excited about that. We closed officially on Monday, May 6th. Um, so thank you for everyone's like the people that have been here for a very long time and that have seen this journey and gerbil wheel, mm -hmm. especially Catherine. I just want to give a special note. I think you've gone through five potential yes. buildings. Uh, five yeah, five <laughs> times through this process and, uh, you know, so many different what can we afford models and everybody from, you know, Anthony, some of the political support you've done and the nudging and reimagining the allyship that we needed for that and all the work on governance and reading contracts, Erica. I mean, like literally everyone in this room had such an integral part of that. Um, so we released that Monday. Prior to that, a huge shout out to Ms. O'Neill. We met to do some just communication planning. So what does this mean for parents? What does this mean for our stakeholders? So that when we do close, we are ready to hit on all of those dominoes. Also worked with a partner on getting press releases out um, and have been really overwhelmed by the positive response, not just from our Steel City community, but the overall community of Gary. Um, so we've gotten like phone calls from people really excited. There is like, it's been posted in all the like the Facebook groups, like, you know, you're from Gary or what's up Gary and all of these things that really positive, overwhelming positive response that a really interesting subgroup that I want to start thinking about how to use or a former alumni of Duncan and Lincoln had been posting on all these social media platforms with pictures when they were at school. And here's what the entryway looked like and all of this. And so it was a subgroup I wasn't really thinking about on how to invest in this journey. Um, I think it could help from like a donor base and a capital campaign, from a vision keeping base. From And so like my brain starting to work through like who are these different subgroups that we want to continue to like bring alongside us. But that's been a really fun one. Like I've been Facebook messaging with this guy who graduated from Duncan in like so the mid seventies. And he's like, I'm, I want to give back. Like, what can I do? I think another, like, you know, Midtown is such a vibrant neighborhood in Gary with just like an incredible neighborhood feel and community. And so we've had people who live on the block that have reached out to us and like, we can't wait that this building is getting repurposed and how can we support? And so there's just been, there's obviously an overwhelming positive from our still city community, but really unexpected subgroups kind of coming out just, you know, vocalizing their support. And so I, will, I, my brain's really working on how do we keep them as allies of Steel City in all the ways. So if anybody has any thoughts on that, um, I'd love to hear. Um, I would say there's a small subgroup that, and the pushback hasn't come to us, but um, there's been some, the backlash to the Gary Community School Board. Um, so although we're, we're all positive in our school board meetings, they've had to take some heat um, from folks. So um, just as it relates to the dynamic between the traditional district and the charter school sale, because it's the first time in history a building has ever been sold to a charter school. So it's like very groundbreaking. Um, and for some people where, you know, they're really set on charter schools being the enemy, um, it's been hard to kind of like work through that. Um, so I hope we prove that they, we want them to be a, a part of the community and along for the ride. And so that's another group that I'm thinking about, the people that are not happy about this sale acquisition and and really the symbol of what it means that charters are here to stay, whether we like it or not, you know, politically charters are here to stay. And like, um, and I'll talk a little bit more in the governance working group, but we've been really fortunate that this, the new mayor's administration, which has been in office now for about like 130 days. I only know that because the state of the city was last week. I don't like to have a tracker. Or anything. <laughs> last week it was 125. So I'm just doing the mental math. Um, They've, you know, and really not only spoken in words, but aligned it in actions around really being a mayor that is here for all children in Gary. Public, you know, traditional public school, charter school, private school. So at the state of the city, for the first time since I've ever been here, um, they invited all the superintendents, principals, and for each of us to select students. 
and we all got to come on stage like during the state of the city they've started hosting these like mayor's round tables for all school leaders um and so we're hosting like a citywide safe summer program still city is going to be a site for all of our high school like sat boot camps and some of this um for it doesn't matter what school you're enrolled in like if the school's in your neighborhood come on in and so i think there's some really positive trends that are happening from a political landscape that not only set the conditions for this to happen, but I think we'll continue to like accelerate this. Yeah. So um, where we are at, any kind of high level questions about response, actual final close, before we talk about kind of what's what's next. What does the state school program do? It kind of depends on different locations. So we're, <laughs> We're in school, we're, Steven, sorry, but we're the last school in session in the city of Gary. So we're in school <laughs> till June 11th. Uh, but some are starting th that first week of June. We're not starting our programming until July. So we give the, our staff then the rest of June off so they can come back recharged for July. And so, but I know like the Hudson Campbell's is starting that Monday, uh, June 3rd. So they're doing like a rec center safe summer. Um, the Urban League um, and Dr. Allen, they're running 11 sites throughout the city focused on early literacy. So like uh, Bethune's gonna be a site, City Life Center is gonna be a site, the Boys and Girls Club, Steel City will be a site. So it's kind of, it's going to be staggered, but I know that many of them are launching on June 3rd. And so we um, actually just got an email that we're gonna get all the collateral for like all the sites and, and all of the organizations are gonna post them on their websites with the registration links. So ours should be up there on all of our socials and websites by the end of this week. Yep. And what's nice is like, you can do like a rec track, you can do an academic, you can do experiences. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. I think it'll be a great win for parents too, to have a place and they're all free um, to be a place. The only con and what we're trying to thought partner in is currently because it's such a significant cost, transportation is not provided. And so what we're working on, Johnny Rucker, who's um, the head of youth services for the city of Gary, we had a meeting last week with Gary Public Transit to see if we could at least get free bus passes and, you know, give them the opportunity to ride a city bus and try to, you know, navigate city routes and what that might look like. Um, and um, they're definitely open-minded to provide that. So we're trying to navigate transportation is just so expensive. Um, and so in order for us to, for it to remain free, we're trying to figure that out. Um, all right. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like, okay, you close on the building and then it's like, well, let's get to work. So the next morning, so just from a risk standpoint, I think the board should be assured, like we have a uh, liability insurance now on that building. So it is covered. It's in our policy. Um, we also, thankfully that building, it was one of the reasons it was like, um, a set above many of our other options was already under security surveillance and monitoring. And the company that uh, was monitoring is the same one that we use. So we were able to, it, we didn't even turn it off. We were able to transfer it over within 12 hours and it's negotiated them to only add $87 to our bill every month. Um, and so it's now on our app so we can like watch Lincoln. And um, yeah, we have a very like sophisticated app where it's, you know, you can see everything on there. So it is fully, uh, you know, monitored under security surveillance. The head of security for the city of Gary, Cliff Caldwell, is also like, you know, a, a friend of mine. And he's like, Katie, I am around that building all the time. So it's like good to know not only do we have the monitoring, but like the district continues to be, you know, um, partners on that. We also got the building rekeyed uh, and a cost that was incurred by the district. So that was really great. They realized there were a lot of master locks that were also the west side locks. Um, and so they incurred the cost to get the entire building rekeyed. Um, and so we are now working on, as so Neil and I kind of like our continued, what's our cadence, our frequency and our mode of continued and not only give people updates, but provide input. Um, and so we have been working really hard with the architects. So if you go to kind of at the end of the ED report, you'll start to see some initial drawings. So we're in our like, uh, what's called our schematic design phase of uh, this property. Um, so if you kind of look up on the screen or in your packet, um, you know, so we are on about 17 acres of land on that property. Uh, there are, you know, two school buildings. Lincoln is the one that we will be 
you know, utilizing. That's the one that's in the best condition. And then there is also on uh, Duncan, um, it'll be a part of our long-term plan to get that demolished. Um, right now, we'll just need to get it fenced from a safety perspective so that nobody's able to access the building. Uh, but what we're working on right now are like the site maps. So this is where it starts to get like really interesting, like starting to talk about traffic patterns. How many bus stalls do we need? How many parking spots do we need? Um, where are all of our entrances going to be? We've just secured a civil engineer through our architect. So we're gonna go in front of the board of zoning appeals next week with the city of Gary for the first time to start to get civil engineer permits um, and to do a traffic study to determine like how much, how many parking spots we need. Do we need to, you know, widen the streets? Are stop signs okay? They'll do a big traffic study for us to determine if anything needs to change from the city perspective. But with our architects, we're really working on just like a lot of the traffic patterns and making sure that as we're building our budget, we're accounting for this. Um, and then the fun stuff. So we're going through then all of our building maps and um, we've got our senior leadership team. It's sort of, we've got, uh, envision this as like a series of concentric circles. So our senior leadership team is kind of our core schematic design team. So we meet for 90 minutes a week with our architects currently on Tuesdays, where we are looking at the configuration of the building, aligning it with like our space needs. Um, and so some really exciting things um, that just already is leveling up the amenities and the facility access that we're going to have. So you'll see like, we have a gym that's like in, that we're going to be able to use. We have a like, uh, we're going to be able to have two cafeterias, uh, a warming kitchen that we can then transition in in phase two to actually being able to prepare all of our food, our, a big nurse suite. Um, this, our elementary teachers are going to be really excited. So elementary will have bathrooms in the classrooms. Uh, this really came for some feedback from, from, from some of our early elementary teachers. Um, we'll be able to have libraries, a music room, a teacher workroom, a teacher staff lounge, all of this. So um, we're kind of working on the phase one of this. Our next concentric circle is we're going to start launching what I'm going to call like our facilities vision keeper groups. So how do we keep our vision and our model and what makes Steel City so special? Mrs. O'Neill, as we were talking a lot, is like, we really want to talk about new building, new opportunities, while also assuring our parents, families that it's the same values, it's the same vision, it's the same team. And so how do we keep this like family knit, really like, you know, school with really strong values, high standards of excellence. And so starting next week, I'll start inviting parents, um, students and staff to join in as we go to the next phase of the design process. And that's where we're really like, so this schematic design is like, imagine like the 30,000 foot view, then we're really going to get into um, the design build of understanding like which classrooms should have an exterior entrance, right? Like, does this make sense to have the little kids on the bottom floor? Do elementary teachers think they should go on top? You know, like, we'll get into much more of the nuance layered. And our goal is that by July 1st, we have these plans fully done down from a schematic to a development design so they can be fully handed over to the general contractor. Um, it's, it's the one they, didn't always they do. Yep. So they're leading all of those. And then what we're also building out is like, okay, you know, some of the decisions we make in phase one have long-term financial implications. So we're also trying to build, okay, what does this building look like fully grown out? Like our phase two model of this, and if we want the front office, for example, as the central hub of the building, we should do that in phase one. So we're not incurring additional significant costs in phase two. So it's this balance of planning for phase one while also backwards planning some of those big cost items like where restaurant restrooms go and plumbing and all of this. So we're really, really being like cost conscious as we think about a future phase two of this. Um, so Cordon and Clark's leading all of this, and then they'll also will co-facilitate then like our vision keepers groups with students, parents, and that's also where meticulous comes in from the community design standpoint and how we're getting other input and gathering all of that input into some analysis of, um, before we like implement what that, that might look like. Anything, uh, new, innovative that they bought into or what? schools are doing today that you know obviously our, yeah. our old schools in Gary don't don't have right uh, just so ideas they're, that they brought to the table. They're really obsessed with like I guess the big new thing is becoming a green certified building mm -hmm. um, from like an environmental standpoint. And so they're talking a lot about 
how do we take advantage of a flat roof building for solar panels? Um, how do we take advantage of it maybe for additional learning space and like, you know, um, and so that's been a big talk. Like what's our commitment to a green building? Mm -hmm. um, there are some mm -hmm. things where upfront, it's gonna be more expensive, but if you like look at costs over time from you know energy to et cetera, like it might be saving us costs. So that's some modeling mm -hmm. that we're doing right now. The other one is a lot around and it does align with our like our, our gear and flame or some of our, uh, a lot of our small groups is like collaborative learning spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to balance you know, one of the things we love about this building is the bones are strong and it has a really strong structure. And so we walked through last week and it's like, what walls? And so that's actually what we're going to do on our call next uh, tomorrow. What walls are fixed that like this would be significantly a significant cost to take it down? And what walls are non load bearing that we could knock them down and create more collaborative spaces? Um, because right now, what the building structure looks like is like what buildings look like when we went to school. And so how do we create some of those more like open learning spaces uh, that do does align both with our model mm -hmm. and like sort of new age schools while yeah. not incurring a significant amount of cost for a building that's like so structurally, like the walls are concrete, right. <laughs> you know? And so that's um, the work that they're bringing to tomorrow's meeting. Like, hey, here are some walls you could play around with. Mm -hmm. We would not recommend that you play with these walls yeah. because that like cost is gonna become north of 50 million pretty quick. Gotcha. Yeah. Is there anything they're talking about in terms of exterior aesthetics? Like this is all important. Like yeah. It's important the bones of the school and like the learning spaces. But I also believe that, you know, the schools that do really nice signage, really yeah. interesting entryways that make people feel welcome, just mm -hmm. provide, it just levels up from the old fashioned brick building to yeah. new. And yeah, we've been talking about that a lot. So where are these, like the this black arrow and this white arrow, we've been talking about, especially this black one. So this white arrow is the main entrance. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful, like you walk up these stairs, there's a flagpole, like, I mean, it's just like stunning. Um, this one is on like the corner and right now it's just like two doors you open up. And so we're talking about like doing a canopy that kind of like goes around like the edge that has a lot of Steel City signage so that you can see it from 19, Both you can corners. see it on Pope uh, and doing the same here. And so we're talking about how to, leverage signage and things on these corners um and then use this main corridor as like the hub of an entrance um but yes we are talking about that um and so these these black arrows of the corners so we're really trying to leverage that that's great yeah mm -hmm. it's just even thinking about from an enrollment standpoint we want people to know whoever is driving by or yeah not, like that it is burned in their brain like don't forget about Steel City, it's right down the street. Right. The other advantage of one of the many reasons we chose Cortigan is they have a partner firm they work with, which is this SPS Plus, which they specialize in marketing. And so tomorrow they're going to bring some stuff, even like, how do we get signs up there right now? Right? Like yeah. Steel City, like future home of Steel City coming soon. All of that we would be able to put into the loan package from like a soft cost um in terms of marketing and so they're going to bring some designs tomorrow because we want to start putting it up there like you know one of the things we had to do at elaine lock because it's an older building is uh one of our board members is a sign person it's like their business uh -huh. and so they put these huge brackets up on the old building that have all of our beautiful banners of like blue ribbon school mm. top 10 schools in u.s news and world report and they're really nice signs they have to be redone because they're not every couple of years because they weather. Yeah. Um, but then we just put new the new accolades up. So I don't know if they can put yeah. some of that into the budget. Do you have any examples of yeah, yeah. send you the PDF perfect. Around. Perfect. Yeah. Just like I'd love to just yeah, see yeah, just so you could show them. Yeah. And then we do signage on the fence like for enrollment so that it's not just a fence that's like facing the neighborhood because mm -hmm. like you said we're gonna have to fence off that one building how do we then repurpose that to be a surface that we're advertising yeah. there's pictures of our students on that yeah side. as like a platform where, rather than like the QR code for enrollment mm -hmm. like things like that yeah so I'll, I'll forward yeah to that'd be awesome it's crazy. It's crazy. It's becoming what? What will be the uh, new student enrollment capacity? How does that compare to the current building? Great question. So fully grown out, this building has space. If we, you know, 
do like the required square footage per student based on the state of Indiana, I could get up to 700 students in here with no additions. Um, it is on 17 acres of land and it's not in a floodplain. <laughs> so there is also opportunities for additional new build, but this current Lincoln as is with the two levels and all of the current space up to max 700, that'd be tight, um, but it certainly has the space for it. And currently we're, you know, 350. Um, so certainly a lot of room to grow um, as we go over there. Any other, that's a great idea about the um, building and the marketing. Any other questions that it's like sparking or ideas that it's sparking for people, either from a marketing, branding, storytelling aspect, from a design, stakeholder groups and investment and keeping them along for the journey? Any other things that? I know we talked about like not wanting to grow too fast, mm -hmm. but still like growing enough to where it makes sense to go into the new building. Has there been like any more thoughts or discussion on like what we want the enrollment to be at the open? Yeah, right now with the open, we would, our, that we would just add one additional kindergarten. So what we have in the open is that we go up to 375. So keep steady on the rest of our school and then start to do the slow growth of a two kindergarten model that then would become two first grade, et cetera. So you'll see like the two Ks in here. Um, and then also, and you'll see when I go into enrollment numbers, I think it's, it's post the announcement, we've seen a huge uptick in high school applications, uh, which has been interesting. We've talked about that. That's where we've seen a lot of attrition from the eight to nine for like a real high school experience. Um, and so we also would be able to enroll more students in our high school because right now we're under enrolled in our high school. So fill out some of the weird little like we wouldn't even call them bubbles, but deficits almost in our high school enrollment. Um, and so you know, in terms of cohorts, only adding one kindergarten that first year, but we'd be able to sprinkle in some more high schools too, because right now we're under enrolled in those areas. Yeah. I think part of life too, I know when the Lighthouse got their gym, mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a game changer for yeah. the school. Mm -hmm. I think it was like one of the biggest things yeah. they could have done because it brought that like school pride. And mm -hmm. we're talking about like the high school is one of us like high school experience. Mm -hmm. I think having a gym is going to be enough of like, oh, yeah. a huge push for Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's like human nature, people like new shiny things, you know, like, and so how do we capitalize on that? Well, also like, and what we're going to stay true to who we are, right? Like a new, and that's why in my message, I'm like, you know, we've always said we're not the four walls that we're in, like, we're going to continue to be a school that's about like our values and our vision. And <laughs> Now we have a gym, you know? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it's like working like on that branding and those talking points, you know. When it's all things like the science labs eventually would be there. Yeah, it's part of the phase two. Although we will have two science labs in this one, like a six eight and a nine twelve. Even in phase one, is in the plan. Yeah, so it's as much about the gym as also some parents yeah. are really interested in the science and a, yeah. and a library. Yeah. yeah, and a huge art room for like our incredible art program we have. Yeah, and just thinking about are they pushing a lot of thinking around this, like a library in terms of being like social, like social, yeah, multimedia, uh, a multimedia so center. Just, yeah, so okay. we've already like through a grant had for our student media course have like four of those like massive, really nice like is it four or two? No, two like of the big MacBooks, you know, yeah. and some of them yeah, like the Mac accessories. Right. So yeah, definitely more of like a multimedia. Like we're not going back to like the Dewey Decimal System or right, anything. Right, right. Yeah. This might be not on your radar, but I work with someone um, actually just like coaching and volunteering um, who is a designer that designs environmentally stimulating classrooms and building spaces oh, wow. and um, has a lot of research around like how you should paint the walls and should you have pictures of leaves or trees in the classrooms like when you don't mm. have windows and access. It might be an interesting conversation for yeah. you to just have. I'm not sure if they are that um, design group is thinking in that way. But no, I think that'd be great. And design schools. Yeah, yeah. I think I would love that. Okay, yeah, if I'm you want to do a connect. Dave, yeah. okay. His name is Dave Rose. I'll connect with Okay. I think the other thing that we had talked about, I think it goes back to our board retreat was how do we, what symbols from this building do we want to take over and what like legacy and storytelling of capturing this building. And so 
um, I'm working with a video videographer to start capturing some of this space and kind of the story of the move and the transition, um, because I think it'll be really good from just like a legacy and storytelling perspective to have a lot of that. Um, but somebody brought that up at the board retreat and remember mm -hmm. and it was like such a good idea. I think even emphasizing next year, like, you know, like going out with a bang, like, yeah. last like what's a rally, like, what's, like, what's a rally like, cry. Yeah, like, yeah. You're the last to this to get taught in this building. Right. It's special. What? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good yeah. like branding idea. Yeah. Like well, yeah. Time yeah. I like well, that. it's funny because I teach seventh grade math and the seventh graders are really excited about that. They're like, we get to finish middle school in this <laughs> building and start high school in a new building, you know, and it's like That's those little thing. things like, um, yeah, our seventh graders are fired up about getting to be the first high school class, you know? Um, so I think that's interesting to think about for like a rally cry for next year. And, uh, yeah, um, I love that idea. Um, I mean, depending on... <clears throat> you sell this building to there's a lot of if they were to demolish it you just like screw <laughs> wow <laughs> wow that's what yeah. Like, yeah. 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 yeah 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 which is likely which is sad i think yeah. likely what's going to happen yeah um so the group the uh brockenheimer truck trucking company which is right next door is interested so they called after the article. They're like, it's yeah. fine. Oh, yeah. Oh, Gary Fire, who's right next door, is really interesting. Gary Fire would likely keep a lot of the classrooms and turn this into their training center. Um, I was just like joking with the new fire chief. I'm like, well, you better come with a dollar because Brokenheimer <laughs> is talking. And then like the owners who own this back building, they're interested. They totally demo this and just use it as a parking lot. Which is like, oh, my emotional connection. Yeah. But um well, I'm not there. No emotions. <laughs> I know. And then she was the spray painting. I, I know. You did paint the cafeteria wall. So. I'm going to spray paint. I can spray paint. It's like the burning where you like just, yeah. I know. I did have a, a parent who was um, asked, like, do you want me to go through the building and stage it? <laughs> like, would you like to? <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> I know, yeah. Uh, Mr. Stevens, Saul and Sam Graham's mom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's so lovely and I just love her. Yeah, I was like, I, I feel like you can't say no to a stage offering. Yeah. Um, so we have also uh, released our RFP for our general contractor. Um, so we've got those in. So this was pushed back a little bit because we hadn't closed. Um, and so this will be ready for approval at our June 17th meeting. Um, and then our goal is that, and our um, architects, Cordon and Clark are in the interview process with us. So, because that partnership is gonna be really critical, both from a cost perspective and a timeline perspective. Um, so they'll, they are starting to do the interviews. Um, and so we'll, for our 17th meeting, um, just to keep on your radar, we'll be approving a general contractor with the goals of then starting construction July 1st. Mm -hmm. So, big groundbreaking. yeah, so I think that's the, uh, like, so some of those other, I think that's the big work I need to do next is like, what are these, what are the big milestones and timeline? How, how do they get, you know, communicated, celebrated, who, you know, all of that in just terms of like a milestone plan. Um, but yeah, that'll be some sort of, you know, a gold shovel and somebody, yeah. Um, so we're targeting a July 1st, um, which would, if that's on track and we know how construction projects go, it would allow us to move in for a fall of 2025 start. So they're still trending and they feel confident right now on where supply chains are, but with an upcoming election, a lot of things could change. So it's been really interesting, I think, for the board to be aware, like on all of these calls, they're talking about the election. Um, both from a cost, so in my finance calls with Sajin, uh, and in terms of like timelines and tariffs and I mean, all kinds of things. So I think it's just something for us, obviously, that there's, there's some variables that are going to be out of our control right now. If we meet our July 1st, uh, securing a general contractor is breaking ground, we'd be able to move in for next fall. Um, but knowing that, you know, and by next fall, fall 2025. Um, any other questions? We'll do some updates in the finance report, kind of on where we're at with financing. Um, but any other kind of high level questions about facilities? 
you know, that's why you were all here. And I was like, the big thing I don't, you know. Um, all right, I'm gonna kind of roll through. You guys have a lot of reading that you can do, but I'll kind of touch on some highlights for the rest of the ED report. One of our big priorities, both to support uh, building our facility reserve and the sunsetting of ESSER has been a priority of mine on uh, receiving a million dollars of competitive grants. We had surpassed that. So right now we're at, um, we've brought in $1.3 million of competitive grants. Since the last time we met, um, we did get, if you guys remember from our February board meeting, you guys approved that we could submit the application for the charter facilities incentive grant. That application was submitted. It was fully approved in full. So we got $211,000 which essentially means like our acquisition was completely paid for, <laughs> um, which was great. Um, and then we've got uh, a digital learning grant that we've submitted through the state. Um, and now they're really starting to ramp up um, in terms of, of future grants that are coming down, down the pike. Um, the other one, are, as it relates to organizational sustainability, and this is really on Catherine's and my radar, we even talked about it in our check-in last time, is there's not been a lot of time devoted to the priority around like leadership succession planning and some of that. Um, so Catherine and I are really starting to gear up on that will be a big priority. Um, two big announcements. So we run a, a program called Gear Up, um, and this is to specifically focus on our paraprofessionals becoming licensed teachers with us. Um, and so we had two of our paraprofessionals who have graduated in the last month, got their uh, bachelor's degree, which is really exciting. Um, and that will be full-time teachers with us next year. So it's like a proof point that some of our like succession planning, at least in some of these more junior roles or in pipelining that we're doing are really working, um, which is really gonna support some of our, our talent needs uh, and what's continuing to be a talent shortage. Um, we also tripled our applications for our teacher leader fellowship. So this is a program that we run. It's a two-year fellowship for veteran teachers who are high-performing teachers who also have a set of skills and strengths that they might not feel are getting fully leveraged or positively impacting the school and are interested in leadership. So last year, we only had two people apply. This year, we had six. Um, you'll see you know, everything from an elementary literacy TLF, which we succession plan to be a future director of instruction. We have some branding and uh, a marketing TLF, which I'm really excited about, a parent engagement, a new hire mentor. Um, and so that's been an organizational sustainability program that we're con continuing to see some strong returns on our investment. Um, so just board calls to action. If you are interested in joining any of our facilities vision keeper conversations, those will be focus group conversations I'm doing with staff, students, parents, and community leaders. If you're interested in joining those, let me know um, and I'll add you to our invites. Um, and then, pardon me? You know, Mike Curley loves joining everything. I'm like, sir, you're the busiest retired person I've ever met. His wife messaged me. He's like, does he have another Steel City call? I'm like, he's just joining them. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, right. Um, and then continue, I think particularly like with this building, like it, it opens up our ability and like right fit grant opportunity. So if you're running across anything for like playground equipment, like that's really top of mind. We've always had these like playground ones and I've never applied, but like any sort of sports, any sort of like a music program, you'll see on the schematic design, we have a music room. We don't own an instrument. So like uh, Mr. Stevens would, you know, would love to uh, be the band teacher with his French horn skills. Uh, so any of those grants, as you continue to like, if you come across any of them in your networks, social media, whatever, please send those along my way. Um, talented people, we are in the season where we are focused diligently on retaining our people and hiring new people. And so um, we're piloting something new. Typically, we, when we're in this hiring process, we don't bring anybody on until August. But we had an incredible, a, like incredible candidate come in for middle school social studies, and but she wanted to start right away. And so we're piloting her starting early in quarter four. We've never brought anybody in this early, um, but it's been awesome to watch her just like integrate into our systems, get started. So that's Miss Payne. She's middle school social studies um, and she's already signed on to return for next year. So it's like one less hire that we get to do that we're excited about. Um, we do have four focus areas in terms of next year. So if you're people that have teachers in your networks, we are in need of a kindergarten teacher um, and a third grade teacher, a fourth and fifth grade humanities teacher and a middle school math. Um, and so those are our high need areas uh, instructionally. So if you know great people, great people know great people, send them our way. 
Um, we launched our application. And as I mentioned last time, we have it on a new platform um, called Nimble, which is meant to automatize um, the process and avoid people getting in bottlenecks. Um, and so, so far we've had 57 teacher applications. At this time last year, we were only at 32. So we're significantly ahead of the game in terms of where we are for talent. We've brought 22 in for phone screens, seven in for in-persons, three final rounds, and we've made one offer and that person has accepted. So um, we're a tough group. Uh, so you'll see from who we've uh, made an offer, uh, we continue to hold like a really high standard. Um, so, um, and then in terms of our intent to return form, we have 98% of our staff who noted on the intent to return form that they plan to return for next year, um, which is a really like in this climate, I think just like a really strong indicator of our staff culture, our morale and their commitment to this organization. Um, two, the two that are not are both teachers that are transitioning out. Um, one moving back to Chicago, she's a Teach for America, and then one leaving for some personal health challenges that she's navigating. Um, so yeah, so we feel really good about where we're at. Um, and especially with some of our, you know, Tara's able to step into those spots, we have a much less load in terms of a much smaller load in terms of what we need to have for the next year. Any questions as it relates to talent and people? Last year hiring was a, a challenge. Mm -hmm. it, it just the COVID came over and now things are kind of getting back to normal. Like what was I mean, I think um I mean, if you look at all the other indicators, like enrollment and education programs are down, uh, people are leaving the profession. I think nationwide, this is a challenge that many schools are facing. Um, I think um, our work that we've done over the last year is a lot around branding and storytelling of why Steel City is a place to come. Like, this is the place if you want to be a teacher that you truly get to teach. Like, you don't have to discipline, <laughs> you have professional development. You get So we're trying to like, really do our marketing around what we do well through social media and through our avenues. And I think that's like really supported. And then our referral program is really strong. And so when we bring on new people, we really try to cultivate, especially that love it here, we really try to cultivate their network. So, you know, of our 57 applications, I would say a third of those are referrals. Um, and so as we continue to bring on great people and they'll stay with us, it's like a new network of people we're able to tap into. Um, I mean, but out of those 57 applications, the zero are for math positions. So we are still experiencing those hard to fill positions and we haven't been able to crack that code. Mm -hmm. um, I think we we will in the 25, 26 school year. So one of our paras who's at Valpo, she's our middle school math para. She's gonna be ready. I mean, she's doing her student, student teaching with us next year. So I see a plan in 25, 26, but next year, I, I don't, I don't see that changing in terms of us finding a high quality math person. I did have a call with Teach for America today at three. So that had always been like a sustainable talent source for us. And they backed out of Gary last year and kind of left us high and dry, like pretty close, you know, like in the heart of hiring season. Um, so I met with their executive director today and they are relaunching the Gary region effective mm -hmm. next year uh, because they were able to secure a certification partner. Um, and, you know, at least I, I came through Teach for America as a STEM mm -hmm. person. And so... Uh, we don't ha we have we don't have access. They have four core members. I'm ho I'm crossing my fingers and um, that one's a STEM uh, because yeah. that's historically been the only way that we've been able to get STEM teachers are through Teach for America. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and that's why we kind of went to like oh we got to grow our own right and that's why we shifted a lot of our talent, mm -hmm. time, and energy to building our own internal pipelines. Yeah. Um, and that's the long-term game, but in the short term, yeah. you know, it's really hard. You were saying, what, what was the school you were saying last week? Uh, having some payments. Yeah. yeah. So I, prices. yeah, what it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So I think for the contacts, like many districts, you know, Hammond has to cut $25 million from their budget by October 1st. Mm -hmm. And if they do not do ab, which is the group that's currently taking over, uh, has taken over Gary is going to take over that district. So they are laying off a lot of teachers. Right. Um, and so we have a teacher that came to us from Hammond. So that's one of the ones I'm right. tapping like, yeah. hey, like, you know, because and with the sunsetting of ESSER funds and people that potentially mismanage those funds to bring on a ton of teachers that they could not then operationally cover mm -hmm. post ESSER, I'm envisioning there's going, but like, I keep waiting, Anthony, and they're not coming, you know? I'm like, 
I just know if I refresh, there's going to be a math teacher. Yeah. So there are these like indicators in the landscape that they could be coming. Mm -hmm. The question is like, when, you know, yeah. um, because I know Hammond's getting a significant amount of pushback. So they have announced that already that they're closing four of their schools. They've laid off a lot of janitorial staff and that paraprofessionals. Yeah. And so they have a lot of senior people that have made this well and that's what i've heard is that they're starting before they lay off the teacher base they're starting to talk to more their more veteran staff to say hey you want an early retirement yeah. um because right now with the union the model would be the last in first out mm -hmm. um so it'd be a lot of the younger teachers um so so we're hoping they yeah. they thought maybe at their next board meeting is when they had announced teacher layoff so i'm keeping an eye on it but i think it'll be a lot of districts that are larger districts that are going to have to navigate that mm -hmm. so it's like how do we get in on that without just like stalking the fire list you yeah. know yeah <laughs> i mean i will i don't have shame yeah, really like and michael's I'm like oh. yeah exactly like i'll do what it takes for a good you know um i will put on your radar like i think it's in here may 31st we're hosting our annual steel city soiree this is Emil joined us last year it'll be at uh, a new spot in gary called the tiny's coffee and cocktail bar it's right on Lake Street. Um, so I'll, I'll send that in the follow-up. Seal City Soiree is a way we believe, like even in how we recruit, we are always telling our story and always showing like what our values and vision are. So we host a talent event um, at a Seal City, or at a Seal City, at a Gary location to A, say like to us, Gary matters. And if you're not willing to come kick it with us in a Gary location, this might not be a fit for you. Uh, and then B, we tell like our Seal City story and have staff kind of share their experience, why they choose Seal City board members as well. Um, and then they get to do, if they're, they get to bring their resume and we do like speed dating interviews. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we move them forward, that interview replaces the phone screen. So they move right into what we're reading. I'm reading a lot about this younger workforce is like, they want you to move and they want you to move quick. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so we're trying to come up with innovative ways that keeps the integrity of our process and the standards we hold while also trying to accelerate the process and be a little innovative Friday, May 31st. I know your questions before you ask them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'll send that out. We just locked in the spot today. Um, cause I would, do you like one? Yes. Like we can just add it to okay, <laughs> perfect. Sometimes people find that intrusive. Uh, that's how I like to move to. Um, I will. And, you know, um, come on out and have a cocktail on this fairway. Miss O'Neill enjoyed one last time. It's a nice place. Yeah, isn't it so nice? Yeah. So, and I think it's um, it's a great in this idea of like being a part of the really positive transformation of Gary. There's several new spots on Lake Street that are just I want to continue supporting. I want our school to continue to support um, because they're Lake Street's got some awesome new spots. So, yep. Um. All right. Going into quality instruction. Um. I, I know Catherine's going to share a lot in academics. Um, I'll just laser in on uh, attendance. Um, and so this has been navigating chronic uh, absenteeism has been like one of our big priorities. And I'm really proud to say that in quarter three, um, we now or like year to date uh, up until quarter three, we only have 7% of our students who are chronically absent, um, which last year in comparison, we were at 26%. Um, and I'm reading, you know, and you probably, Gloria, have more like real time data. I mean, this is just like a national epidemic. And I mean, we've really been able to tackle this. Um, you know, kids come to school when they feel safe, loved, uh, and taken care of. And so that starts with the aspirational environment. We also have a chronic absenteeism team that, you know, after you reach day five, we go either go to the house for a home visit or they come in. So we do like a wraparound meeting to really understand the root cause. Um, and so there's just been like some incredible work that's uh, allowed that to happen. Also for the first time since December of 2019, we have 100% of like, which was, you know, right before COVID, we have 100% of our grades that are now above a 90% daily attendance rate, which is just like really, really huge. Um, and like, you got, you know, showing up is, is half the battle. Like you gotta be here in order to learn and in order to get access to all the things. So that's been really huge. Uh, Catherine will share a lot about like a, a lot of the events we're doing and invitations. We did last week host our senior decision day, which is one of our milestone events that really uh, embodies our vision of ensuring that our kids are prepared for college, vocational school, or the military. Um, so I just kind of broke down some of our class of 2024 stats. So we have 98% of our kids who are on track with the post-secondary pathway plan, which we're really excited. This is our highest percentage that we've had. Um, and we have that have 
what we call a financial indicator for matriculation. So we track like, have you put your deposit on your housing, <laughs> housing experience? Have you paid your orientation fees? Like that's some skin in the game, which we know are the litmus tests for matriculation. Um, we also had eight students, uh, Michael and Anthony, you guys will be excited, accepted in the I, IUB or going to IUB. Uh, eight of those on the groups program. Uh, so eight, yep, eight group students this year, which is our highest groups. Last year we had six, the year before seven, um, but we have eight students going to groups. Um, so right now at IU, we'll have 28 kids wow. in the groups program, which is wow. really awesome. So that is a program for um, students to like that may either be coming from uh, high poverty areas, first generation college students, um, and it's a way to get there with financial support, academic support, social support. You were a group grad, right? I absolutely. Was. Yes. I not be here I was also. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and you were groups as well. Okay. Um, so such like an incredible program. Um, I don't know if you guys want to speak anything else about your experience. They just they ensure that the kids are there. They're not, they don't get lost. And they provide all the support that you need to just many, many programs. And I, there was just so many of us at that time who would not have made it had it not been for them because they really invest in the young people that they come. Yeah. It's all the support that you need. I could not say enough about the program. I think I mentioned this last time. Mm -hmm. We get together at the Toronto Freshman Program. And I just think they get enough publicity. That's so great. Um, you know, it's there. That's awesome. Yeah, I just love the uh, because it starts in the summer. You're just kind of there, and all the group students stay in the same dorm, mm -hmm. or, and you the transition. It just helps tremendously with the transition mm -hmm. and to establish immediate friendships and a network. Um, and the ability to just kind of navigate things around campus by being in career counselors and things like that during the summer before the fall semester starts <laughs> and then the other oh, 35,000 yeah. students. <laughs> uh, so I, it was, uh, I still got, I got lifelong friends oh. that I met. And then many of those had academic deficits. I mean, they mm. kind of gave you an assessment mm. and kept you in the grades. Mm. And, and yeah, so we're really excited. And it's like, it's truly like, now like a Steel City Groups program. I mean, 28, yeah. you know, and so it's all- Every year do they take in? That I don't know. That's a good question. I do know that um, last year, I don't know the data this year, last year, to your point around it being like under-marketed and underutilized, we were the only school in Gary that sent kids to groups. Which is, which is really, really yeah. surprising. Yeah. And, and so- that was there were kids from Roosevelt or Wallace, West Side. I think every high school was, was represented. represented. Yeah. yeah. So we, um, our director of college and career readiness, Ms. Smith, she is a group's recommender. So we hosted some like Zoom meetings and sent mm -hmm. it to the college counselors at other schools because a recommender can recommend you regardless of where you go to school. Mm -hmm. um, so we, there were definitely more apps. So I'm hoping that means that like more kids from Gary are getting this experience too. Um, Cause it is really incredible. And we have, our data is we have not sent one kids to groups that has come home. I mean, to your point, like it's almost like a, you're getting across this finish line, <laughs> like you know, um, 100% are still I'm just there. Happy, you know, to live in this place. <laughs> 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 um, and in addition to that, then we had 21 additional students who got the 21st Century Scholarships, so uh, covering 100% of their four years of Indiana tuition. Um, so it's one of the reasons we have a lot of kids who matriculate to Indiana universities, because this, I think another one that's totally underutilized is this 21st century scholar program. Um, but it's something you apply for at the end of your eighth grade year. Um, and so we're now have hundred percent of our eighth graders, um, and you have to meet certain metrics throughout your four year, um, high school career for GPAs, community service, college experiences. You know, you have to have tight accountability from an adult to make sure, like, because not only do you have to do those, you have to upload them to this portal, or scholar, or portal, scholar track, all of this. But we have 21 of our seniors who are going to an Indiana university for 100%, like, no cost to them from a tuition uh, standpoint, which is really awesome through that through that program. So, um, 
Cool. Um, and then branding and storytelling. Um, our big efforts this year are around, or this time of year, around re-enrollment and enrollment. So I'll be coming with updates on those frequently. Um, re-enrollment. So currently, we just got those forms out. Currently, we're at an 83% completion rate. Now we're going to like individualize strategies. So our office assistant is making calls to get that all the way up. Of those completed, we have 96% of our students and families who are planning to return, two that are unsure, um, and two that are no's. So we have a group movement, uh, a family, those 2% is one family right now that's moving back to Indianapolis. We also to date have 116 applications. So these are student applications at this time last year, we we're at 95. Um, so we're trending a little bit. Um, but la currently you'll see the breakdown in our grade bands. We always have way more elementary, um, but high school now is picking up. So we've gotten of those 38, 32 of them have come since our facility announcement, which I think is a data point that shows like that really does matter from like a high school because in last time this year we were at five high school applications. Um, so I think it matters and it makes me think about this rally cry for next year around like, don't wait till 2025, 26, yeah. you know, like my brain's going on that idea. It'd be really nice to fill in some of those holes before. Yes. Like, I think that would make us all feel better. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, if we could increase our high school enrollment, exactly. And that's how we're also thinking about the Safe Summers program. We're focusing on offering high school courses here, and we think it'd be a great recruitment strategy. Like, come in, meet our teachers, meet our staff, do our SAT boot camp, do our college writing class, do our college algebra class to try to fill some of those academic gaps um, that we're specifically trying to recruit high school students for the summer safe programs that we think will hopefully matriculate to enrollments. Um, all right. Those are the ED reports. Uh, any questions or uh, points that I did not mention before we get into? Was that last week you hosted the mayor's? Uh, next week. Next yep, week? Okay. yep. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the governance report for 24. Mm -hmm. You're next. All right. Oh, no, I was like, governance is next. Erica. You want to take team? Yeah. Or you want to take it? You can start. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, you know, we've got five big priority areas that you'll see at the top for governance. We have met our key results uh, for board recruitment. Thank you, Michael and Gloria. Uh, but we are always, like I say, we're always recruiting. We're always recruiters. Um, we are. Um, especially now, I think Catherine can put the feather in her hat in the cap that she has got, supported us getting the building. She might be ready to transition off. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So we are still looking for finance board members. So I'll continue to put in a plug um, about, you know, continue to tap your networks on anybody for a board. Um, we've had a priority around increased stakeholder partnerships. So um, originally we were planning to host a mix and mingle prior to this event with the purpose and goal of um, increasing awareness and telling our story to community leaders about Steel City. Um, and since we met on the board, uh, as I mentioned, the mayor's really been walking the talk about uh, a mayor for all Gary kids. So he started an initiative called the uh, Mayor's Education Roundtable, which started in uh, the beginning of April, and it convenes biweekly with all superintendents and principals from every school in Gary, traditional district, a charter, private, as well as all of our university partners, and youth uh, organization leaders. And so we had been hosting all of those sessions at City Hall and the mayor was like, well, if we say we're about education, we should get into schools. Um, and so they asked Steel City to host the first mayor's education roundtable, um, which I think is a huge testament to what they see, like the work that this team is doing. So Friday, um, we finally got the date. So it says in here the week of May 21st, but Friday, May 24th, we'll be hosting that from 9 to 11 here. Um, we just got those details today, so I'll also add that to the calendar. Um, board members are certainly welcome. Um, it's a, a two-hour block. Seal City gets 30 minutes of those two hours. Um, and so we plan to do an overview of our story, talk about different ways to engage from like board recruitment to the facilities, vision keepers, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, allow them to tour the building. The city council will be here. There'll be other, you know, members of the mayor's administration. The uh, first lady has been really active um, in a commitment to early literacy. So she really wants to be in schools and talking about reading and talking about the I read. And so um, we'll be hosting that on May 24th. And then our governance team's plan is 
hopefully that'll be kind of the teaser and people will leave like really fired up, whether it's about board recruitment or partnering with us in other ways. And that we host a follow-up meeting um, after that, after we've sort of cultivated and gained interest um, to continue to have them be partners and allies. Um, and yeah, so any questions about that? No, cool. Um, legal compliance. So Erica Young has been our contract queen. Uh, we also both for her peace of mind and our board and organization's liability, we also did secure an Indiana lawyer who specializes in contract law. So Trent McCain, who used to be the deputy mayor actually, uh, is on retainer with us. So you guys should just know as a board, every contract that Erica reviews as it relates to this facility, he's reviewing too through the lens of Indiana law, through the lens of our liability and making sure we feel good. Um, and so, and I even convinced them to give us a discounted school rate. Those hourly rates are wild. Uh, so it, same thing we went through and did all of uh, that due diligence through our architect contracts um, and our purchase sale agreements, all the closing documents and everything. And then they'll do the same as we get to, oh, I didn't take the note out where I put in all caps, sorry, to Erica, send me your buy up. <laughs> Sorry, Erica, I did not mean to put you on blast from the governance notes. <laughs> yeah, she sent me her chat GPT bio. She goes, oh. she go, yeah, I was like, you are incredible. <laughs> yeah, she had to adjust the prompt to be, can you be a little more humble? Humbly. <laughs> Um, all right. So, uh, and then just so you know, um, from a authorizer compliance, we needed to uh, submit a letter when we were ready to close so that they could approve that as well. So we sent the authorizers, um, letter. They have approved that from an authorizer standpoint. So we've got all the documents and, uh, of that, um, as it relates to compliance, it's our year of audits, uh, and audits that are tied to state and federal dollars. So, Thursday is our big food service audit. I know Mr. Stevens and Mr. Krumbeck and the ops team are ready for that to be over. That's really critical because how we score on that and uh, depending on any findings has financial implications because we are a national school lunch program. So there is an abundance of compliance requirements for that. So um, it was, uh, it is scheduled for this Thursday. So stay tuned. Um, what you'll see, and we actually have a board vote, so I'll just kind of go through it now because it seems to fit in. Um, so every um, one to three years, but uh, depending on your contract, we are required by state law to put our food vendor uh, up for bid, okay? And it's just a, a way that, A, we're ensuring that we know who's out there and B, that um, from a procurement standpoint that we are allowing that to happen. So here's kind of what we've done. We got... Um, and just to kind of go back for people that have joined, in April of 22, we had a food vendor that sent us a notification and said that we've decided to no longer service any of our schools in Gary. <laughs> and that was like, you know, we'd already signed in the contract. We kind of went into a scramble. So in May of 22, we had to open up a bid and we received no bids. Nobody wanted to provide food service uh, to Steel City. We did end up from the state getting contacted and connected with our current vendor, which is called Eat Enterprises. So we didn't know anything about them. So we only went into a six month contract. They were great. Um, and so after those six months, we re-upped with them for another year and a half. And, uh, and so that's who we're working with now. And then got notification January of 2024 that um, we, it was our time that we needed to put it out for additional bid. Um, and so on March 17th, we uh, submitted our invitation for bid, which is an IF, IFB, and did all of our public notice from a procurement standpoint in the Northwest Indiana Times. Um, and then on May 6th, we have to legally do a public bid opening. So we opened our bids. We got two bids. Um, so you're required to get one. We got two. We also did a taste testing. So we invited people to come in and taste. Um, and then they also, all the vendors submitted their proposals or evaluations, et cetera. So just some unique things about um, our bid um, and our invitation for bid. Because of the challenge with our storage, we require a vendor who delivers meals to us every single day. Um, because of our facilities constraint, we don't have like massive storage space for this to happen. Um, and because we buy uh, from our building code, we do not have a kitchen where you can cook, you can only warm. Um, and so the meals need to be packaged so that we can warm those up. Um, and so we had two bids. Uh, we had an Eat Enterprises and a Clark Foods. 
Um, and so you can kind of see from the state required evaluation matrix, e Enterprises is a little more expensive, although um, the and they we use uh, this year's our food service logs to give them an estimate. So this is based on our current trends. It's a little more expensive um, than Clark Foods and also unfortunately doesn't taste as good as Clark Foods. Uh, however, uh, we had to eliminate Clark Foods. They are out of Indianapolis uh, in terms of their headquarters and they would only be able to deliver to us on a weekly basis. Um, so although unfortunately they tasted better and they were cheaper. Um, Maybe we, after a week it doesn't taste better. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Probably after a week the food is bad and would not taste better. So unfortunately, <laughs> we had to uh, automatically, and so we reach out to the state, say, hey, like, even if our matrix says like, the food's better, it's lower, are we able to eliminate legally? Uh, and they're like, they're unable to meet your bid requirements, so we can. Um, and so we are making a recommendation on behalf of the ops team to move forward with Eat Enterprises. That is our current vendor that we're using um, for next school year. Um, and that, you know, almost needing to go with them based upon our staffing needs and our storage capacity. Um, we have been talking to Clark and say, hey, are, we have plans to move into a new building. Like it was better food, it was this. And so we're keeping them warm <laughs> and kind of in our dating pool. But in, with our current situation, we're making a recommendation um, to move forward with the enterprises. Uh, we'll do a formal vote at the end, but any questions from like a compliance, a procurement or a governance standpoint? I know it's more expensive, but is it is it healthier? Mm -hmm. So because be it's more mm -hmm. uh, uh, daily prepared and. No, both both yeah. vendors are required because we are a national school lunch program. There are like very strict requirements about the size of your fruit and how many fats you can have. And Mr. Mm -hmm. Stevens, you might be able to speak to it a little more, but they, you know, they have to meet those guidelines and both of them aren't going over in terms of like providing more fruit or, you know, any of those things. Um, anything you want to speak to on that? No, I didn't cover it. Yeah. Um, all right, so chugging right along on compliance. Um, other big compliance things that are top of mind. Thank you for everybody. And I apologize retroactively for my stalking I did, but thank you for your uh, bio, your headshots and the background checks. Um, those aren't just things that I wanted to have. Those are re compliance requirements from our authorizer that were required, so thank you. Um, and then just want to continue to keep this group updated on legislation. So there was a lot of new bills passed that I think the board should be aware of. Um, so one is Senate Bill 1, or you might be hearing in the news, SB 1. This is a new legislation that goes into effect starting this July, that if a student does not pass the IRE 3, which is the test you take in third grade to assess your reading levels, we are required now by law to retain them. So they will have the opportunity for two administrations, an initial one and a second one. Um, and if they do not pass, they must be retained unless they can get a good cause exemption. And the only way you can do that right now is with an IEP. Um, and so that's gonna be a significant bill. Uh, I think it impacts enrollment, it impacts like, you know, schools are trying to figure out, you know, what that looks like, um, but that'll go into effect. And then we are, the other part of that bill, which we already do is 100% of our second graders are required to take the iRead, um, which we already do. So there's no problems there. But if a second grader doesn't pass the iRead, they are required to do summer school, which is a best practice we are already doing. So the big implication will be for third grade next year and any student that does not pass after the second administration will need to be retained. Um, so our work on that is for parent orientations, making sure that messaging is getting out really early. We also are put that in our summer school letters for our kindergarten, first and second. They're like, hey, start coming to summer school so you're getting that intervention now. So we're not waiting till third grade to fill academic gaps. Um, but this is going to be like, you know, have implications in terms of staffing, enrollment, a bubble grade potentially at third grade to support needs. And so our brains are already working on how we're going to navigate that. What's uh, our like, pass? Yeah, this year we had our, um, yeah, we're like at, over the past few years. Like, yeah, so good. like um, the state average right now is 61%. So that's why it's, or 63%. 61. Yeah. 
61 after the first administration. Right now we're at 63%. So we're beating the state average. But that's, you know, so, um, but, you know, after second administration, we have not gotten past 75%. So there's still a quarter of third graders that would need to get retained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lot of kids. Yeah. Andrew, just so we kind of understand what we're really what is being intentional and social emotionally when we're building up to develop and then no longer what yeah. Right. That legislature just aren't thinking through and don't, don't have through. the context like, to be thinking through. Feel like to be second grader, third grader. Oh. Yep. So that'll start next year. So we're trying to plant the seeds for parent communication on that and trying to also use it as a way, you know, summer school is an intervention. It's not a punishment. We're trying to do like a lot of branding around marketing around that. It is to fill these gaps so that we won't get to this point, you know. Um, a, a couple other Senate Bill 185 is just is requiring now all school uh, districts in the state of Indiana to create a policy about banning cell phones in the classroom. So this has really come uh, from a post COVID. We have a no cell phone policy right now. So cell phones can't be seen or heard. So not a huge impact for us. There's a new truancy bill to address chronic absenteeism. We're, a lot of the things that are now mandating by law we do as best practice. So that will significantly impact one that will, both from an academic master schedule and a finance and a staffing, is they're now requiring effective next school year, a middle school civics course, a middle school computer science course, and a high school financial literacy course. Again, in vision, I'm all like, this sounds great. Uh, from a staffing perspective, I don't know how we're going to shake it. Yeah. Uh, from already, we have such a small staffing model and what that's going to look like, and we don't have it in our uh, budget to add additional FTE to teach these courses. Um, and so how we're gonna implement that to be determined, but effective next school year, those are courses offerings that we are required by law to. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, so on my superintendent's call Friday, I'm like, could we partner with junior achievement and have them come in and it needs to be a certified teacher in the state of Indiana was the response that I got. Is there any online options that we can do? Yeah. That's a good thing yeah. to think through. I mean, if we have to do online, that's really mm -hmm. Yep. What was the third request? Civics. 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 Yep. Computer science, yeah, and then financial literacy. When they say civics, is that like, are they including history and then are they mandating what can and not be taught? So they've already sent us all the Indiana academic standards with the course, and it culminates in another assessment um, that kids will have to take the citizenship exam. Oh, well, come on in. 20 years. Yeah, come on. You want to teach? Teaching civics and government in high school. I did civics and elementary and government. Yeah. I, I mean, again, it's I think, really actually very good. Yeah. If it's like how it actually works versus boring history. I, mean, I have yeah. a master's in history. I'm a history person, but it's like yeah. dry. Mm -hmm. you know, civics and government were actionable. It was kind of yeah. the fun part. Ms. Pratt teaches our high school U.S. government class, and the kids love it. Love it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, I'll give you a little history teacher. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, 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 I was high. Like, like, <laughs> that was dry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I did four centuries <laughs> history. You did a great job at it. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then just federal legislation update. I don't know if you've seen, but Title IX um, regulations have changed and the removal of, you know, I don't know what the language they're using. It's like the, I don't know. They're getting rid of Title IX. <laughs> That's not like as clear as I can say it. And so, um, we have gotten the only communication we've gotten from the DOE is that they are kind of interpreting all that's coming down from federal government. Um, and they'll let us know August of 2024 how and in what ways that'll impact schools and requirements from sports to course offerings to the definition and of sex and gender and what that means for bathrooms, what that means. Like there's going to be a lot of upcoming things um, that we'll know more after August of 2024. Is this isn't this an offshoot of Affirmative action question. Is that this? Oh, is that the in, That's the question. Got, got it. it. Brought into question. Affirmative action got rolled back because you couldn't prioritize a group, and then they said they couldn't prioritize. Yeah, it has been the talk of the legal landscape of like a DEI is being like 
aspects out of everything. No. And it's like now we've all suits for implementing DEI. And so yeah, this is the like that's why I was this is the cousin question. to it yeah. of like yeah. so they attack DEI, now they're attacking like the gender race. Yes. I mean gender like sex issues. Yeah. And it's just to eliminate any use of diversity exactly. in yes. any way for anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you or any of your school partners started to navigate what that means for any policies, systems, facilities? Like, have they started to navigate? All we're hearing from the DOE is the blurb I put in here. Like, stay tuned, August 2024. Yeah. No, not yet. But okay. I, don't, I also, I feel like this is like but Indiana is more focused on this. Oh, yeah. Right now. Um, this is in line with our. Yeah. Like, oh, we're the Midwest, so Florida. Florida. Yeah. I have a charter school, and it's what you cannot say is crazy. Yeah. It's like like they almost way. are, they're about to say you can't say social emotional love. You can't use those words. It's also like right now, the good thing is it's just schools. Like they don't know how it's going to translate mm -hmm. to like all of these other areas. But right now, it's just like, you can't factor in mm -hmm. any diversity, anything, mm -hmm. and let it like it can't be tied to basically an image mm -hmm. within the school. Yeah. I think oh, like the oh, long term mm -hmm. wondering I have oh, good. Uh, is around uh, like free and reduced lunch funding, mm -hmm. things like that. Because that, that, that's the tail of this, right? It's just continuing to go down, like anything that creates and when we're saying equity, which means you're giving more in one area or making mm -hmm. special exceptions, that's ever, that affects everything. But that, that's I heard a principal example. from Indy talking about what we're worried about is we're going to have to remove free and reduce lunch and require families to pay. And mm -hmm. all of that extra title money that we get because of the status of our students is a significant part of the budget. Yeah. So what would you say our title money is? Yeah, we are at four, like four hundred seventy-four thousand dollars in just Title One this year, which is aligned to our complexity indicator, where the main algorithm element of that is our free and reduced lunch percentage. Well, that money pays for what our paraprofessionals. All of our paraprofessionals. So it's it's a significant. It's not something that's cut from the budget or paid for. It would drastically funds. change our. Uh, educational program. Yeah. What I've been seeing is one of the schools who like really, um, for their enrollment next year, like they just eliminate any like diversity, low income, anything. It's just like a special experience, like anyone can apply and they select based on a special experience. Because of, you always just have to keep it broad. Like I, I feel like you can still do it. It just has to be identified. Can you give me an example of what you, what do you mean by a special experience? So like if you just <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> so, yeah, and, and that's what it is because we can we can determine what special experience is. So it can be like, oh, you grew up in a household where like perfect <laughs> recorded. Um, yeah, like any anything that would make kind of low income still like yeah. if you're a low income and you have a special experience of like beating adversity or like you please overcame a challenge no matter what that challenge is um you're then like a special experience that qualifies for like an advantage because you bring something special to admissions but it really is a workaround of risky well, that's what we were wondering for, like, um, like I just put it like on for Gloria. Well, it's coming in diversity, but you have to make sure it could apply. Certainly. Right. Well, I was, I hadn't even thought around until you said that, like, but I thought about it today is like, should we be revising our enrollment packet? Mm -hmm. Like, can we ask any question about gender, race, mm -hmm. anything anymore? So I might need your legal guidance like on that. Yeah. Something that, yeah. that people are sure. I mean, we're a public school, so it's like we don't, you know. Yeah. But I feel like that's fine as long as it's an option to the clients. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not a check in the boxes. Yeah. Like they feel it. <laughs> yeah. Or like a. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 So stay tuned. It's getting wild on you. Yeah. Did anything ever manifest off of their public web website where people could make complaints about anything? Oh, yeah. Um, we haven't gotten any complaints, okay. but they now have a Twitter handle. So I took one last night. 
there was somebody that did a I took a screenshot of one. I don't know. I was like, you want to no, I know. <laughs> but I saw it. Yeah. Um, so somebody that the now, so for context, there's this new site that was launched by the Indiana Attorney General that was called Eyes on Education, that any human, parent, student, staff could um, make a complaint against a school, school leader or an educator around um, harmful content, harmful to children. It's not validated, it's not checked, it's just posted. Now they're taking every complaint and they're putting it on Twitter. So there was Brownsburg Community Schools got a complaint yesterday. Somebody like did a lesson about gender equity in sports and it was comparing the revenue and contracts of WNBAs and NBAs and that got posted as controversial and detrimental because we're trying to indoctrinate that men have an advantage of like the, a, a, a financial advantage in sports. I'm like, they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that got, so that's an example of the type of content right now that's getting posted there. Um, and so, so no, we have not gotten any complaints. We did submit kind of the chain of command of what would happen. So if something gets submitted, I automatically get a notification. We then, and I like, um, you know, open up an investigation. And so I like put that we get four weeks for an investigation. We, I would determine if the content is in fact uh, detrimental to children, I would need to bring it to the board. Um, and then you guys would make like a final, you know, upon my recommendation, make a final decision on if the content should be removed. And is there any consequence to the educator that is, um, there's no retweet, you know, or like response to the tweet. Yeah, but no. I don't know I'm saying like uh -uh. we found this to be invalid. Mm -mm. I don't know. The Twitter just got so launched, so maybe that's a part of there. Huh? That's what's so messed up. That is. You can never be seen anything. Yeah. All right. Well, in that same vein, we also by the end of this month need to post. So this will be something in the for uh, approval. But uh, shared this with our governance team. They gave feedback by the end of this month, by the end of May, we need to have posted on our website a board approved policy of how parents can challenge materials in our classrooms, textbooks, library books, whatever it might be. Um, and then we need to show dissemination of this policy to 100% of our parents through our SIS system. Um, so this is what we came up with at the board. We researched like the American Library Association and some other schools that have handled it. Um, high level, this is kind of the procedure. So a parent would send an email to me. It includes the name, title of the book they're challenging. I thought it was interesting. I also saw some asset-based approaches to this that parents could challenge and they want an addition to our library. Maybe they think there's like an absent narrative or an absent voice. I was like, I like that. Uh, so I'm trying to add an asset-based approach to this thing. Um, and then I'll respond, acknowledge receipt of formal request and provide the upcoming schedule of board meetings. That person challenging must read the book um, and intend the, the, uh, the following board meeting to present to all of you as a school board. In their presentation, they must provide a recommendation uh, for the removal, excerpts of the language from the section of the book they are challenging and the rationale for their request. The governance, so you guys will all hear, you guys can ask questions, then the Steel City Governance Working Group will discuss uh, in the subsequent meeting and make the final decision. Um, and then I'll email the person and be responsible for all the communication of that. Any questions? And then uh, one other point to note, while if a uh, item or um, is being challenged, I did put that it will remain on our shelf and available to the school community until the decision is made. Um, we'll vote at the end, but any questions, any feedback, any thoughts on that? Have we ever had anyone challenge that? We have had um, challenges to classroom decor. Mm -hmm. Um, but that has been no, we've had, we, I mean, I think we do a good job of getting parent consent for, you know, videos or even surveys or whatever it is, but so we'll have people opt out, um, to experiences or learning experiences, like a middle school sex ed program or whatever it might be. But, um, so we have opt out for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, but have the systems in place, like even before we survey children, we do, you know, a survey and you know but um no no curricular challenging yet 
But I, I do think, you know, you don't know what you don't know. I think once this gets emailed out, we could see it. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't done a lot of forceful communication around like, this is a new law, you know, mm -hmm. but now they're requiring we show proof of 100% dissemination of our parents of this new law and the policy of how to. So that's what's happening in governance. <laughs> it's a wild place there right now. Erica, I will <laughs> remove from the, um, send me your bio and phone. Yeah. <laughs> my apologies. You know, I was gonna say that in my email. Right, <laughs> you reviewed and said this looks good. I'm like, no, I can't have the governance CV and the last one to send this to me. I was, I was talking about her too. Her name wasn't quite in caps, but she was close. <laughs> She's like, I'm not writing that down. Yeah. 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 I'm just like, I'll get in her inbox. Just a gentle nudge. No, it's when I get the text. Yeah, that's my communication mode three to you. Oh, I know, I got one. I got one. <laughs> Just a reminder about sending out the board email. Yeah, got it. On <laughs> I know you all are very busy. That's my job to manage it up. Sorry again. So we don't <laughs> I don't know. We all do sometimes. And I'm happy to provide it. <laughs> That's what I tell my people. I'm here to nudge you. <laughs> yeah. Yours is coming for our weekend work block to finalize the budget. All right. Yep. Yeah, she's it. I'm waiting for your nudge until after this meeting. <laughs> See you here on Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, financial report. I don't have a lot to share for you guys about this, but uh, the work that we've done since we met, met last, uh, we reviewed the January, February, March, or quarter three uh, budget actuals, and we updated our financial health metrics to see they're all green. Another thing that I didn't add on here is we finalized our the review of the form 990 that's the tax return. Um, so it's all signed so they're delivered on time. Could have added that to compliance. Yeah, on time. Uh, as for kind of our financial um, forecasts and results, nothing's really new. We're still trending um, on target for our base revenue and our competitive revenue. It's being shared. And then Expenses. We have some additional expenses with the acquisition of the building. So it's the building expenses and those like three. Uh, what do you call them? Soft, soft costs. Mm -hmm. Soft costs. Uh, but we're tracking and just kind of keeping record of so that we can wrap them into a whole um, financing package if we need to. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty much. Right. I think some of the work that we're going to be doing is like working on preliminary budget. I mean, we didn't have that figured out, mm -hmm. but that's easy. <laughs> Katie? Um, so, yeah, living in financial health, I think, um, particularly folks that have been with us for a while, I think that's like our cash flow and cash on hand is something that we'll just like, I mean, starting to keep me up at night now, right? Not because we're in a deficit, but because like, we're about to have a lot of costs in ESSER. So I'll just be sharing a lot more financial health indicator updates on like, how are we tracking on cash on hand? And so, you know, you'll kind of see right, right now we're at about 2.3 million cash on hand at end of April. Um, and then we're also like one of our priorities on the finance working group has been starting to dabble like with some low hanging fruit of earning interest and having our money make money. Um, I've kind of gotten obsessed with it. Like at the end of the statement now, I'm like, hey, how much money have we wanted? Like I can see how people get addicted to this. Like I'm ready to start doing some liquid CDs and moving stuff around. Uh, but even like just since January, we've like earned, you know, almost $15,000 just on interest, you know? Um, and so we're starting to like really think about um, how branching out on additional uh, investment strategies and Anthony's like kind of leading that charge and being my thought partner with that. Our next big milestone and marker is working on our preliminary budget. This is really probably our most like critical budget uh, in the last few years because we're removing ESSER starting on 930. So we're really trying to have a proof point of our financial health and financial sustainability when this large influx of 
federal funds are removed, right? Compounded by the fact that we have all of these one-time facility costs that we're needing to front until we close on a finance package, right? So we're kind of running all of those concurrently, which is why I'm checking our cash on hand every day. Uh, so, um, so yeah, Catherine and I are working on our budget, working with our leadership team and me doing a lot of just change management, both as our leadership team and our overall staff. Like we've gotten spoiled the last few years. Uh, it's going to start feeling tighter, both because of the facility and Esther. So even when I did like my announcement to staff about the building and talked about what's next, it's like, here's how you can get involved. Oh, and also, just like when you buy a house, like we're officially on a budget as of today, you know? And so like just managing that expectation. So um, we are uh, considering a, a, some potential FTE cuts, um, not as much based upon ESSER, but we are also, there are plans that we'd be losing our GEO post-secondary grant, which funds our entire college and career department. And as you can see by the numbers, they're doing phenomenal work. Uh, and so we're trying to find other grants to supplant um, this GEO grant that's been running with us for um, the last three years. Um, we're also working as a finance team to just do a lot of market research around cost of living adjustments and how do we uh, find the right value that, you know, um, makes our staff feel like positive and appreciated while also being really conservative from a budgetary standpoint. So we're landing like in between the, the two and three percent, um, which is just affirmed and validated at the business officials meeting last week. Um, so feeling good about where that's at. Um, and then in terms of ESSER. Um, we are chipping away, so we feel really confident about where we're at in terms of um, spending that down. At end of April, we still have about $622,000 um, remaining that needs to be spent by 930. We went through every line item because those aren't just like a big pot of money. Those dollars are allocated in different object codes and for different purposes. So we went through those costs. There was about $383,000 that were like, we don't feel 100% confident we could spend this down for like remediation programs, salaries, for example. Um, and so we submitted an amendment to get 383 of those of that 622,000 reallocated to transportation and facility costs, which we know are known costs um, that would really be able to help support from a cash on hand budget relief standpoint. Um, so um, feel really good about that. Other um, key result three is just around financial controls uh, and the onboarding of new team members. So as cash mentioned, we successfully completed our form 990 for the first time as a new finance team and got that as well as our ICSB reports. And then um, Catherine and I are working on getting all of our capitalized assets. It's like gonna be really critical now and we wanna just make sure we're starting July 1st fresh um, with a lot of the, the big expenses that are coming. And then um, we're spending a lot of duplicative time and effort running to financial systems right now. Um, because we're required as a charter to do accrual accounting, inquired by the state to do cash reporting. And so we're just spending a lot, like we have to do payroll in both and hard code in. It's just like a lot. And so that's like our big research project to think about freeing up some much needed bandwidth on our finance team. Um, <coughs> facility financing. So as a finance working group, we went in and talked a little bit about project costs. Our sort of number that we were working on was about $10 million dollars for this phase one. That's what we felt we'd be able to afford based upon some models around what interest rates we're looking at and what our budget uh, five-year pro forma is. Um, interest rates have not dropped. Uh, and so, but our facility costs are going up. So right now um, they said, if we were to build that beautiful building with everything that we showed you and all those reservation um, uh, classroom renovations, we're talking about $11.3 million. So we're now value engineering that line by line and going through is like, how do we get that closer to 10 million? Um, the really good news is that um, the state has released what's called the common school loan. Um, and historically charter schools have never not been able to apply for this. And from, this is a positive note of legislation. Now charter schools are eligible to apply. The reason this is important is we can apply for about $9.3 million and it's at a 1% interest rate over 25 years. So this is a huge game changer because what we are able to afford drastically change if we can get a $9.3 million loan at 1%. Um, the challenge is that, you know, there's no such thing as free money. So they released the application on March, May 9th. It's due May 31st. So our team is working diligently to get this all in. Um, and in that application, we need to submit a very detailed project cost, which I feel really good about where we're at with that. We need to uh, submit a 
really detailed project plan. I feel really good about that. And then we need letters from like our authorizer that we're in good standing. Before we uh, apply, it will also need a board signature. So just keep your inboxes ready. That last week of May, I will do some not gentle nudges, hard nudges. <laughs> um, my goal is that we get that submitted May 29th, just so it gets, you know, um, but that's, that's a really big deal um, because interest rates haven't dropped. So the other people we're talking to right now are at like 7.5%. <laughs> Um, and we thought maybe they'd start to drop, but they have not. And so what likely would happen is that we would take out this 9.3 million, uh, and then we would take out a much smaller loan at that interest rate, probably on a shorter term so that we could renegotiate the terms of the loan, hopefully once rates drop. Um, so we're working on that package, but our priority one is if we can secure this 9.3, it's, it's, just a game changer for us financially um, in terms of what we can do and what our cash flow will be. When do they need to We know July 1st. So the nice thing is they give us a tight turnaround for the app, but they also communicate it uh, very closely. So we have a call with um, the Indiana Treasury Office because they actually, the money wouldn't come from the Department of Education. It comes from the Treasury's office. And so we're meeting with them sometime this week um, to talk about like what repayment structure. The nice thing is, is they just deduct the money from our monthly allocation we get from the state. So we don't pay anybody, you know, it's sort of their collateral, right? We, if you have butts in the seats, we're taking your money. <laughs> um, and it gives them less liability and risk, particularly for a charter school. But um, what we don't know is when we get that money, when the repayment structure starts. And so we're meeting at the treasury office this week. Cool. Um, yeah, and then the only other big thing, the the other game changer for us financially is they are also releasing a new round of what's called the Charter School Program, College Quality Counts Program. This was the grant that actually really allowed Steel City to open. It's it's essentially front loading you money to with the purpose of expanding high quality charter schools across the country. Um, and so we technically would be considered an expansion school by moving to a new location with plans to increase our enrollment. Um, and because of our academic performance, we're eligible to apply as what a designation of a high quality charter. That could get us a two year, $2 million grant. Um, you can't, what's interesting, you can't do any like hard costs of construction, but you could do FF and E. So we could get like furniture, technology, like all of the things we need to like fit the building, right? Uh, and get it ready could all go under that grant. So that application is supposed to re be released this summer. Um, but we got one in year one and it was a three year grant. Uh, and that was just instrumental in Steel City being able to do anything in those first few years. So we're now eligible to reapply. And so we'll be doing that over the summer. Um, and then we're also going to start, now that we have a building, I reconnected with my former capital campaign coach, Andrea, and we're going to work to launch a capital campaign. Um, so, you know, we're excited because once we get our, our project budget really solid, well, then we'll do some specific asks around like the computer lab or the, you know, the library or the playground or start to reach back out of this donor base that we have, both corporations and individual mm -hmm. givers um, to start donating to a capital campaign. So our goal is that we're ready to launch that by like July or August. Pardon me? The naming rights. Naming rights, right. The, interestingly enough, I just read an article that the Jackson family um, just did a huge financial contribution to Lake Ridge schools. So um, so I'm interested to, you know, and the, yeah, it's a naming rights of their auditorium. Yeah. Um, and then key result five, successful audit, check. Yeah, yeah. that was it. <laughs> All right, any finance questions? So Catherine, you have any, no, anything else to add? The June meeting, though, that's, why is that still considered a preliminary budget? Isn't that final by Um, so. Didn't we do final budget during our, oh, I guess that is that. Yeah, I guess it will be final. I'm, I'm working on a preliminary, but yeah, okay. once we bring it to you guys in June, it'll be final. And then once enrollment solid staffing in October, we bring you revised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's June. That is a virtual meeting. Yes, June will be virtual. So June board meeting um, will be virtual and will be focused on the budget. Um, and that is at six o'clock.
All right, well, you guys are probably sick of hearing my voice. So, Catherine, take it away. All right. So, um, we had an excellent uh, meeting with Principal Pratt um, and Gloria. Uh, it was your first uh, academic committee meeting. So, that was great. And Michael's. Um, and Michael's, yes. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, and that was fantastic. Yeah, that was like April 17th. Um, on our report, we do have our academic working group key priorities as well. Um, many of them are listed out and reported out on at this point, but not everything has been met in terms of all the academics. So there will be a final, final um, uh, update, which uh, will get us to all of these, um, you know, K through 12 full um, outcomes with all of the academic outcomes. So. Um, I also do encourage you, if you're able to get the electronic documents to work, Principal Pratt in this um, principal report link, there is a PowerPoint that is very detailed if you really want to dig into any of the academics or questions around um, what is going on in, in a little bit more detail. Um, that is always um, available to anyone as well to look at. Um, but uh, the way this is organized is the way that Principal Pratt organizes it, which is outcomes strategies that she feels like got us to those outcomes and then course correction. So for every section that she reports out on, she gives us the headline of the data and where we're at and then um, the celebrations there and the outcomes, any course corrections that are happening. So um, on track, uh, eighth grade to 12th grade, 20% increase of students on grade level proficiency as measured with fast bridge from beginning of year to end of year. And then there's specific statistics um, listed there uh, around the averages um, and where our students are performing right now. So a lot of celebrations there in detail um, and that real difference there, the one that's highlighted the gap closing difference between state went from 150 points below to um, so only 87 points below the state average, um, which is a celebration. So we basically um, almost cut that in half. Um, so strategy, strong culture of learning increased um, enrollment at the IUN Career Center. Um, just a lot of uh, fidelity to the professional development and instructional support that Principal Crab has been providing for the teachers is then showing up in student outcomes. That's where I'll just summarize it. Uh, but, uh, with all the bullet points, you guys can read everything um, in great detail there of where she's at with those, um, with those students. Um, looking at 76% or more students entering 12th grade at the beginning of the school year, um, as reported by the DOE, graduated from high school, credit-based, so it's a lot, got to meet the standard there. Our outcome, 26 out of 27 students are on track if they pass their semester two to have the, the core 40, which is the requirement. So that's a huge, huge celebration of where our um, high school students are right now. Um, one of the course corrections that's happening um, is really looking at bucket two and three um, from the requirements for the current seniors um, and really making sure that we're able to get, it's the core 40 plus the other um, required elements, um, but progressing well. Um, and he already went over a lot of the um, high school uh, to college transition um, data. So um, you, you have that already. Now this I read, this is important data because that correlates to the new state law of students being held back and whatnot. So you can see all the data listed there of where um, we were at with outcomes from 22, 23, and then in our um, 24 um, outcomes <clears throat> here. So as, oh, you were right, Dave. I read 61. We're at 61. Mm -hmm. The state is 63. Yeah, we were right. Uh, so, um, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> that's still good. But it is, we're, we're growing. Mm -hmm. But I think it does go with what we was talking about before. A real focus has to be put on preparing in a proactive way, our second graders and just that mindset shift around summer school being an intervention and getting them through there. I'm, I'll pause there because this is a big piece of data. What questions do you guys have? I have to answer them too detailed. I mean, I'm sure a lot of root causes to that, but mm -hmm. is it just students, they're, they're starting behind and by the time they get to third grade, the gap is just bigger or? 
Yeah, I, I, I would say historically from our data, our kindergartners come in like below below grade level. And so then there, even though when you look at our kindergarten data, for example, there's big growth happening, they're still not pushing into that green spot. Mm -hmm. So they're growing, that's my simplest way of breaking mm -hmm. it down, but like there's a progression happening, yeah. but still not pushing them up mm -hmm. and over that. Would you say that's yeah, I think that's right. I think process. also you know this is kind of like our last group of kids taking the i read who started kindergarten and covid yeah. so they were like online and you know they just did not get quality instruction right mm -hmm. um and so we're still navigating massive covid academic gaps mm -hmm. um and then i think you know there's been a lot of research and change of like how to teach reading um and i think frankly in our first few years of still city we were not doing it well or correctly and so that's why we joined that literacy cadre um and we're getting ready to go into our third year but it's like it has to start actually like before kindergarten um and so to that point like we've started bringing in kindergartners for kindergarten readiness assessment and doing this summer we're offering kindergarten gear up like kids like entering kindergarten with us like we have to start reading instruction now like we're already behind you know yeah. um and so with like letter recognition and sounds and all of that and so it's not a third grade issue right it is a from birth early childhood a lack of quality pre-k options and gear i mean there's so many um that yeah and, and I, I would say that's in its simplest terms is the uh, you know it's already starting behind a uh, poor quality reading instruction um and i think we're trying to course correct on both of those okay. yeah. is the test online it is online. it is online and one of the things that we saw before when we were addressing this before it was even a thing that we couldn't do is to do more computer-based computer -based, small group interventions in class during class so that they use because a lot of times kids know how to do it they aren't finishing because they aren't reading. They aren't reading enough nonfiction text mm -hmm. instruction, and everything they do with their teacher is like in person. And then now all of a sudden you got to do yeah. other than NWEA. So like doing more stuff where they are using the computer to answer mm -hmm. questions. Or type yeah, like how do we ensure that technology technological literacy yes. is not a barrier? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Which I think we've done a good job of in terms of you know. COVID, I mean, the kids don't know how to use an iPad, uh, um, but how are they getting mirrored um, yeah. academic experiences to that? Does the state publish like uh, statistics and around the demographics of this, this group, right? Mm -hmm. are you, the, oh yeah, I mean, it's totally disaggregated by race and poverty level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Such a big economic and racial divide. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, so I need to give you an idea. Numbers, you would probably say, well, uh, well, exactly. So probably forty yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah. That's actually interesting. I'd love to like. So last year, just to give you an idea, last year after our second administration, right, we were at sixty-two percent. So really close to where we were this year. We had the third highest in the state for charter schools. Oh wow! At sixty-two percent, and charter schools typically serve low income students of color right and so that's all more of our comp and our peer group than looking at like all districts we are the third highest at 62 percent wow um and so in but to give you you know even at the state right now it's only 63 percent, right. and that's inclusive of all groups mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it is it's yeah when is, when is, Sorry, when is what when is it spring yeah um it's like end of march all my testing is end of March, and then we're doing our second administration the first week of June. And so what we've done is identified, okay, who were our kids that did not pass? We put them into two buckets. We have like our, you know, our bubble kids. Um, and then they're getting two days of additional in, uh, in school, small groups aligned to one of the pillars of the science of reading. And then our students who are our tier three kids who are significantly behind are getting those small groups and after school, like really intense intervention and small groups of Coach Kelly. Do you think parents can do at home? Do they know the like the importance of this? I don't not just parents. Yeah, I mean you're a third grade parent. I don't know if you want to yeah. I mean it's what this is specific what goes like, home. Yeah. Right. Like yes. what a blend is. How <laughs> to like you what would you say in terms of parents? I would I would definitely say um parents need to have their kids in tutoring if they're going to if they're in tutoring they need to come in every time they're sitting 
And we even added up because we were hearing from parents, transportation was a barrier, so we're paying for an after school bus. I take kids home. Mm hmm. It's one of the only ones every day her son's a tutor. Mm -hmm. I know this is for school kind of thing, but like some schools that can bring in maybe free play programs in the school to provide more support for kids because they're coming in with such deficits and a lot of parents. Mm -hmm. That's absurd. There are parents who are not taking on that responsibility because when the kid enters and doesn't know the numbers and the after, that's a serious issue. So, just in future, too. It's interesting that actually came up in our, our school design conversation last week. They're like, are you guys have thoughts for pre-K? In our original charter, we had pre-K in there for those exact reasons. The challenge in Indiana currently is pre-K is not funded. Mm -hmm. So it has to be entirely self-funded as a program. Um, and so that's the challenge is like, you know, um, how do we fund that? You know, but I, I think it's critical. I think it's huge for early literacy. I think it's huge for staff retention and like having a daycare early, you know, I think it's just a, like, it's another priority of like funding and, you know, uh, because unfortunately Indiana is only one of three states in the country that doesn't have federally funded pre-K. They opted out of it when Mike Pence was governor. So they do offer a new grant, it's called On My Way Pre-K. Um, and it is a competitive grant that we could apply for. So I think there's hope for the future, um, but we're gonna need to make it a priority. But I think you're absolutely right. I think that's right. I know we do pre-K at Lee Rock in Illinois um, and we do have to get a grant for that. It does not cover all the costs though. So it is a loss leader though in our minds of like we're bringing in our future kindergartners. And so we're supplementing that funding through um, other dollars, but then you know, getting the parents on board, getting the families on board to have that three and four year old. They did make a legislative change um, that you can use Title One dollars now for pre K to fill any of those gaps. Fill the gaps yeah. But I think that if you know if we chose to allocate the dollars there, that those, that's what funds all of our paraprofessionals that's to right. do a lot of our small group instruction that's for right tier two. And so it's like yeah. yeah. I feel like you could try to find maybe a different grant that could support that. Mm -hmm. Do the budget shuffle. Again. Right. Again. Yeah. Well, thanks for that background on that, Katie, because I know that's going to be important for our board to be paying a lot of attention to those numbers and what strategies work. Just sort of one other idea out there. Um, there are a lot of um, artificial intelligence tutors now that mm. are linked to the science of reading or structured reading. Mm. That as long as you have headphones and a microphone, the AI tutor, this chat, it, you can link it to your curriculum teachers can generate readings for it. I'll send you guys that is like so wild and it's right yeah. now $99 a classroom to roster an entire classroom and do AI generated tutoring that is specifically to like blends letters sounds and I've watched videos on it the tutor the AI tutor is not a real person it's the computer will give them the word and what they're working on let's say it's the TH blend and if they say it wrong the AI tutor says can you say this part again and like makes it flow mm -hmm. and then they say it again and when they don't the tutor says that sound makes uh, can you say that uh? i mean it's insane it's insane wow. and so i'll send you that link i talked mm -hmm. to the founder the other day and he's brilliant he's he founded a pre-k to a fifth grade charter school up in wisconsin madison mm -hmm. and it was so successful that they've now grown it out to a full school but it's, it's all literacy based wow um, and then they have this bot the Lola <laughs> yeah, no, Lola bot is, is for teachers. So if teachers are like, I have a student who's struggling with X, it will make a lesson plan for them and say, this is an intervention you should do. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of amazing in a way to think about, you're saying you're talking about tutoring and they need more tutoring. Well, what if they can't be here or they're sitting in a classroom and it'd be great if they were getting that specific individual instruction mm -hmm. right now, like good job. Thousand dollars for a school to have a whole school roster. Mm -hmm. You have access. So anyways, I'll send you the yeah. link, but just something to explore um, in terms of custom things for teachers. Do you know if any of our teachers are using any AI stuff? So, um, I do No. We went to some AI, uh, Stephen was doing an AI session at our conference. No, I. Um, mm -hmm. we have not done a lot of work on AI yeah, yeah. in terms of like from a professional development and a priority. But I think we've got to figure out something and some track and, you know, 
I'll be sharing with you. We're going to be doing some more yeah, testing coming up. I mean, teachers have been doing some things already um, with generation, but I'll be sharing you guys. We're going to be putting together like a, a resource and like here's what it would be best for, and here's mm. what it costs kind of sign. Oh, yeah. So it could be get started. Just yeah. if any, you might have a teacher that's interested. Oh, and, totally. Um, they yeah. can sort of start some testing. It's yeah. A main priority of the school, but. Yeah. A lot of yeah, we might have somebody to pilot it right now. We're like, do you know how to teach somebody how to? I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. But it's it's yeah, it's a balance of like do we really have time for that or how do you use it? Um. Okay. So some of the themes just to move on. Then, um. As she said, as Katie had said, the second administration is projected for the like, the third there. Um. And then. Yeah, I will just note what we're aiming for based upon our data is where our goal is 74%. Like we believe we've got three kids that we can definitely get there. Um, the state goal this year that they put out for all schools is 75%. So I think we could get really, really, really close. I mean, that's great. And, you know, we're able to do um, and then um, in terms of some things that are off track, just to raise this up for everyone, 50% um, of diverse learners are passing in the I read. Um, you can see the percentages there 16%, 35%, 28% um, in that grade three as well as seven. So, and then zero in the grades four and five. So, work that's being done there um, that's very specific around the specific students and what supports um, are happening. Um, and one of those is required to bring tenants because really what you need is individualized, more intensive instruction um, and that high dosage too. Um, let's see. Okay, some campus celebrations though. Um, all of the multi uh, multiple field trips that are happening and really diverse um, sort of experiences for everyone, which is exciting, multiple college tours. Um, that are happening, and then um, they did do special person's day. If you guys follow social media, the folks posted a number of pictures, um, and then parents have been engaged with chaperoning field trips. Um, and then this post-secondary pathways, 96.3% of seniors with their post-secondary option were around uh, with their pathways. Um, that was just a really big celebration that I'm so really proud of. Um, I think some of this re-enrollment stuff is actually was updated in PD's report since April, um, and so that's not necessarily the most recent data anymore, but that end of year testing will happen June 11th, um, potentially, you know, I think the way we've said it, it won't have anything for June 14th. It will be completed by June 11th, not on June 11th. Okay, completed by June 11th, yeah. yeah. June 11th, we're out, we're out of here. Yeah. Like, nobody's <laughs> doing it. <anything. laughs> I'm like, I would just like to correct that statement. It's not adding up. Um, but as soon as um, I get, I think we put something on the calendar for an academic committee meeting. As soon as we have that all summed up, we'll share all those final data. Quick question. What is the uh, diverse language? That is what needs to be special education. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We also use it, and we also do it more broadly of like anyone who might learn different, right? So like we have students who have like mixed mode seating, so they're on a bouncy ball. Like that's a diverse learner. Like they can't sit in a chair, right? Like they need to bounce. Like uh, uh, we have a high ability subgroup, so like who are performing two or more grade level. That's a diverse learner. From mm -hmm. our general ed population, so yeah. they get additional. Like, so we have different tiers of and like subgroups of diverse learners. Okay. I realized that I only knew the definition of the state allocated funds yeah. for diverse. And for us, we brought in our definition of anybody who just learns in a different way. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we have an individualized learning plan for you in different experiences? Okay. <clears throat> They'll go into third grade. They just like bounce them on the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just to plug, we've got some upcoming events too that we'd love uh, anybody that's interested. So Erica had asked, but Sunday, May 26th at two o'clock, we have our high school graduation. Uh, if you have not been or seen, this is a unique graduation experience. It's at the Railcats baseball stadium. Um, so I'll add that to the calendar. So it's not on there. What time do you start to graduate? 
starts at two o'clock. And we are just, uh, just so you know, for Steel City Norms, we are like, if it, we say we're starting at two, we start at two. Uh, and we close the doors at two. Uh, so like, it, it, that's taken a while for some guys. Uh, but we are, uh, we start on time and on time. And we run a very tight ship that'll be like a 45 minute. First of all. Um, yeah, so I'll send out, if you just want to let me know if you're coming, we'll have tickets up at the door. Uh, it is a ticketed event, so you'll need it, but it's a baseball stadium, so there's lots of room. So bring bring guests, bring friends, bring whatever you like. You came last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's a fun event. Students, um, in this way of individualizing and aligning our joy core values, students pick their walk-up song. So a song that like right. represents who they are and that is celebrated the completion of this journey and onto the next. And, and then I edit all the songs. So they have 30 seconds of whatever the lyrics they want. And they walk from first base to home plate with their walk-up song <laughs> playing. I make all the graphics that go up on like the uh, billboards with their like uh, academic stats and like, you know, so it's a fun, it's a fun event. It's not in like a gym where you're super stuffy and hot and bored. Yeah. Yeah. West Side like, like, security or like Yeah, we've security always had security like, there. Yeah, we our school research office team works at the Railcats yeah. also have it. Um, but there was um there was a shooting at a high school graduation there the last year or two years ago. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Um, so that event, it's also just the, the season. So we also, the week of June 3rd, um, we have eighth grade promotion on June 6th. We have fifth grade rising ceremony on June 4th, kindergarten promotion, June 5th. So there's a promotion any day you'd like to come <laughs> the week of June 3rd. Um, I just like, I don't have enough. Like June 11th. Yeah, we're out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's the latest we've ever gone with all these like snow and cold days. Oh, um, so literally the week of June 3rd, there is a promotion or a rising event every day. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Um, that is a wrap on academic report. Um, all right. Um, so let's move into the action items and get through our approvals. Um, I reviewed the February March check registers. Everything is in line with normal course of business, with the exception of um, acquisition and facilities costs. Mm -hmm. for this year, but otherwise, everything is coded and appears reasonable. Okay. Can we get a motion to approve with the February March check registers? Make a motion to approve the February and March uh, check register. Okay, second, um, and we'll do a roll call. Mm -hmm. okay. no. uh, we're just going to do everyone in favor, um, and then we'll go all in at one time. So, all in favor, say aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Any abstentions? Registries for February and March have been approved. And those will come around for email. Oh, yeah. Good. And then we have to do that down session. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'll get those out this week and then follow up. We've got a, it's live for a week. So if I don't hear from you, I'll give a gentle nudge. <laughs> 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 I feel like one day there's like a gentle nudge. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's a hard nudge. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, let's go and get the hard nudge. <laughs> and then it's all capped. <laughs> <laughs> you know? All right. Now the Eats Enterprises uh, food vendor. Uh, motion that was presented by Katie earlier. Katie, do you want to say anything else about this? No, nope. just this is the recommendation we're making uh, to move forward with EAT Enterprises due to our staffing model and storage capacity challenges. Um, we'd like to move forward with them as our vended meals bid for the next school year. Can I get the motion? We'll make a motion to move forward with EAT Enterprises as the food vendor. Yes, we all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any extensions? Motion passes. Thank you. 
All right, then the last is the CLCA Academy policy for challenge instructional materials. Um, Katie went over that earlier in her ED presentation and uh, walked us through all the details of that um, so that that can be shared out with uh, families. Um, any questions about that? Okay, I have a motion for we <laughs> 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 got motion to approve the Steel City policy, policy for challenging and <laughs> challenge materials. <laughs> instructional materials. I'll say, all right. <laughs> yeah. I'll say, go ahead, Amber. <laughs> and bring it over. Uh, okay, any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion for the CLC Academy policy to challenge instruction to the test staff. Um, all right, our next um, last sort of final step is looking at calendars to pick out our um, board retreat night. So last year it really worked out, we thought. We did an evening um, from six to nine. Uh, was dinner, was dreams. Um, was it Tuesday? I think last year, but we could look at the calendar the week of July 15th and let me know right now if you have any <laughs> night you either prefer or that is a block that you could not attend for the month of July. Okay, 19th is out. <laughs> That's not the best. Okay, Don't say that so quiet over Say it with your chest, my darling. You know, it's your birthday, you know? It's your birthday? No, I'm just I think we've all been here on our birthday. We've all been here on our birthday. So you're out of 15. Don't you want to Oh, we'll go. 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 Okay, so Monday, no Monday, no Friday. So 16, 17, 18. 18. And you'll be back then? Yes. You'll be back by 18. <laughs> <laughs> so you feel well enough. You're like, it depends on how much money I'm making. That's right. I never return. <laughs> so July 18th? 18th so, works for me. All right. Yeah. All right, I'm, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Uh, we, we're planning some kind of vacation, but it's not. It's going to be somewhere around the middle of all the big stuff. So, I'll let you know. Right. <laughs> I'm putting it on, Anthony. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we will post that in for July 18th. Again, that's an evening event. It's um, going to be a fun time of year and cycles. <clears throat> Um, and there's going to be a lot of what we were thinking a lot of um, visioning work with the facility. And just mm -hmm. All right, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn this meeting? I'll make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> <Second>. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Mike. <laughs> we don't actually have to vote on that. <laughs> I don't know why, because I would make it at seven. <laughs> <laughs> I <make a> motion. <laughs> Meeting is adjourned. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. The next mm -hmm. meeting is virtual. It is a Zoom. It should be on June seventeen. Seventeen. Waiting and we have another meeting tomorrow, so I need to get. I know. I know. I was over here trying to get it too. Six p.m. Six p.m. Thank you, Katie, for having me. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Because there's a lot of like, people using AI. We did like bad information to address some. Yeah. That's interesting. We have been telling all of our clients. They gave us. The AI policy. Yeah, we. Um, yeah, yeah, like, can you we share? have come out with a bunch of AI policy. For your um, student one, or was there also any staff one? <laughs> I at this I was at this Indiana School of Business Officials conference last week. There were some wild things they were telling us need to go in our staff handbook, but I'll bring them the next one. Oh, I okay. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, okay. Bring some deep face stuff that we're going to have to be ready, ready to deal with. Hi, everybody. How's it going? All right. Thank you so much.
Let me know if you go to Manny. Are you going to be here those slots? Text me. I'm so jealous. We're so happy to have you. Good. Okay, Erica, I have an HR question for you. Okay. Yeah. I was like, I usually have a big long Amazon in my car, and I was like, I'm going to grab it for you. And I turned, and I saw the blanket. Yeah, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to And then I had gotten the same thing. Okay, so I had been holding like, I'm going to write it down before I get to the Yeah. Well, and now it feels like the air is turned Yeah, they turn the heat off. Yeah. Everyone knows that Jabber say that. Like, oh, yeah. Sorry, you got here so early. I know you're a guest because you were originally 